All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the first virtual EdTech rally. Uh, it, there's been two face-to-face -face rallies already, uh, and this is our chance to try to do something um, where we can all get together still but not have to dedicate a full day to go travel somewhere. Um, so we're going to do this uh, and see how it goes. <laughs> and, uh, so far, everything's running well, and hopefully we'll continue to do so. Um, at the bottom of the slide, you can see we have a link to the agenda, and that has a link to um, all the rooms and the sessions. So um, when you get into that document, just please um, click on the room name to access the room, and then the title of the session will take you to a shared Google Doc where you can take notes uh, during those sessions. Uh, the hashtag for today is EdTechRally, so feel free to use that if you are a Twitter user. Uh, the event schedule is here, so we're just going to start our keynote in just a couple minutes. Uh, then we have roundtable sessions starting at 9, 10, and 11. And during that time, um, if none of the roundtable sessions meet your needs, uh, we have an open discussion room also available to, uh, throughout the, this morning. So feel free to hop in there. Um, Tina Tribu will be moderating that room. And so if you want to uh, break out into another room, she's going to help you do that. I uh, just want to give a big thank you to all the people that were involved with putting this together. So um, as part of our EdTech Rally advisory team, um, Carrie Giuliano, or Julia, yeah, I spelled it wrong. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Kit Hard, Kim Powell, and Tina Tribu were huge assets to making this happen, and it really could not have happened without them. So thank you um, all for helping put this on. And then our moderators for today, they're going to be helping out in all the rooms. So um, Carrie, Kit, and Tina, as well as Craig Steenstra, um, they're all going to be moderating our breakout rooms today. I uh, also want to put, big, uh, provide a big thank you to uh, Dan Spencer for doing our keynote. Um, he volunteered. We reached out to him, and he said he would do this for us. And he's going to present on an awesome topic that's very relevant to um, I think all of us that are here today. And then our roundtable facilitators. Uh, these are the people that are going to help facilitate the discussions later on. And so I just want to give a big thank you to all of those individuals. And then I also want to give a th big thanks to uh, the Ritz and the REMC as well as McCall. Um, so for the September rally, uh, Ritz gave us a large donation that really helped drive down the cost of that event. Um, and then, you know, Ritz is part of REMC, and also without the REMC, we wouldn't be able to do this virtual rally because it's because of them that we're able to have these Adobe Connect licenses um, at such a reduced rate. Um, and then also want to thank McCall because we've got the EdTech rally at McCall happening again this year, and so registration for that is open, and um, you can register for that if you want after today's rally. All right, so I've been talking enough. <laughs> So we're going to introduce Dan. Um, so Dan's going to talk to us about flipping PD to personalized learning. And Dan Spencer, he um, was a classroom teacher, and he was flipping his classroom. And now he works over at the Jackson uh, ISD, where he is now flipping professional development. And he's going to teach us how to do the same thing that he's doing. And I see him getting riled up. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to let him go. So. Um, I think everyone can just give him a round of applause. He won't be able to hear you, but he'll feel it in spirit. So Dan, take us away. All right. So just so you know, there's this running joke between me and Andy Losick. Uh, I, I typically I have a favorite presentation shirt, and it's, it's green plaid, and I didn't wear it today. So Andy's giving me, Andy's giving me a hard time. But yes, usually I, I have my... my Lucky presentation shirt today. I'm going with a with a tie, so we'll we'll see how that goes. Uh, but what I want to do here, really fast, is once I get my my presentation up, um, I just have a, a, a quick story. But I am I am really excited to be here and, and to be part of this. Um, what I so here's here, here's the thing. Uh, this is my this is my Twitter avatar. 
Now, the very first time I met my wife, the, the, the first memory I have of, of Rachel is we were freshmen in college out in Rexburg, Idaho, of, of all places. And uh, Rachel's from California, and I met her, she, she asked me where I'm from, and I did, I did this, okay? This is just what Michigan people do when other people ask them where they're from, and I thought everybody would know what that was. And she, she looks at me, and she's like, why, why are you pointing at your hand? And then I had to explain that, uh, and, and then she's like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. So fortunately, I was able to redeem myself, uh, but here's what I want to do now. Uh, I, I really want this to be as interactive as, as possible. So throughout this keynote, I'm going to ask you to kind of share some ideas, share some experiences, share questions, all, all of those things. But what I want to do right now is I'm going to put up a little map o Michigan, and I thank Kit for, for doing this. But uh, here's, here's what I'm hoping you'll do. Um, I'd like you to go in and using the pen tool, just uh, tell us where you're from, okay? So I'm going to give you a few minutes. Go for it. Look at that. So I'll give you a few seconds more to, to do this. All right, so I'll tell you, this, this is exciting. Um, one of the things that, that I feel really strongly about is that, that Michigan is just full of amazing, amazing teachers. And I, I look at, at who's in here right now, and it's just so many teachers and educators who have helped me out. Um, it's like I said, Michigan is, is full of amazing teachers, and that's why I think it's so amazing what uh, has been set up today is this ability for us to, to, to learn together. Now, one of the best things that could have ever happened to me in, in my career is to get to work with Kim Powell, Stacy Shu, Brad Wilson, Shannon Deegan. They are just the, these amazing educators who, who have helped me really figure some things out. And I know not everybody has that luxury. Um, and I know that, but, but one of the great things about this is we live in, a, in an age where you don't have to be alone on this. Um, one of my favorite, uh, one, of, one of my favorite quote, quotes is by Steven Anderson, this idea right now that alone we're smart. So on our own, we're, we're pretty smart people, but together we're brilliant. And I really believe that that strongly, and that's why this whole EdTech rally and, and the, the community that comes with it are just a, an amazing resource. And what I hope you do throughout the day is find ways to, to connect, find ways to, to keep the conversation going long after the, the session is, is over, because that's where the real power comes in. So what I want to do today is just share a little bit uh, about my experience. Um, just quickly, my background is I, I spent about 10 years in uh, junior high and high school uh, teaching science. I spent the, the last eight years teaching high school chemistry, physics, and education, or and engineering. And about six, seven years ago, I started getting into to this idea of flipped learning because I was running into some problems in my classroom of not being able to reach all of my students. and. It, and just some amazing things happened. But when I moved over to the ISD, I really wanted to make sure that I could kind of use some of those same principles and, and use those with, with working with teachers. So here's, here's I, I have a question for you, and there's a little video. I, I wonder, is, is, vid, or is professional development ever like this?
I find that education, I think it don't matter where you go to school, Italy, America, Brazil, it's all the same. It's all just a memorization. And it don't matter how long you can remember anything, just so you can pair it at the back for the test. And I got this idea for a school I would like to start. Something called the Five Minute University. <laughs> and the idea is that in five minutes, you learn what the average college graduate remembers five years after he or she is out of school. <laughs> Would the cost of like $20? <laughs> that might seem like a lot of money, $20 just for five minutes. But that's for like a tuition, <laughs> cap and a gown rental, <laughs> graduation a picture, snacks, everything, everything included. You know, like in college, you have to take a foreign language. Well, at the five minute university, you can have your choice. Any language you want, you can take it. Say if you want to take Spanish, what I teach you is, como esta usted? That means, how are you? And the answer is, muy bien, means very well. And believe me, if you took two years of college Spanish, five years after you're out of school, como esta usted, muy bien, about all you're gonna remember. So in my school, that's all you learn. You see, you don't have to waste your time with the conjugations, vocabulary, all that the junk. You just forget it anyway, and what's the difference? <laughs> Economics, supply, and demand. <laughs> that's it. Right, so, so business, good old business is, you Leo. buy something, um, and, and I know some of you sell will have it for a hard more. time with me. <laughs> I'll, we'll try some different things here. Um, but kind of the, the whole idea behind that is that, that far too often in education, we kind of look at that as just seat time. And, and I realize that, that a lot of us are in situations where we're, where we're training teachers. And one of the things that, that we have to do is, is kind of figure out, okay, how do we get beyond this mindset of just putting in time? Because really what we're trying to do is figure out how do we get, how do we train teachers so that there's an impact on teaching and learning in the classroom? And, and, and that's so far beyond that idea of just, you know what, I'm going to put my time in so I can get my skeks or, or however that, that has to be. And so what I want to do now is just a, a little activity. We're going to see how this works. Um, but I really appreciate you guys who went and, and watched that quick video of me freezing out in the uh, outside um, and introducing what we're going to do today. And for you to go in and kind of share some of your experiences, as I, as I went through that, I could tell that we've been through a lot of the same experiences, both as um, participants in PDs and trainings, but also as as people that are in charge of PDs and trainings. So here's, here's what I want to do. I'm going to put a poll up here in a second. So let's see here. And what I want is I, I want to compare your best PD experience with your worst. So here's, here's what I'm going to, here's what we're going to try to do here. I am looking for my, my pods here. And Oh, okay. So Kit went and jinxed me. He said I was doing a really good job with uh, with managing Adobe Connect, and now you guys got me all nervous. And stuff. But here's what I want you to do. In the chat area, I want you to give me three adjectives that describe your worst experience in a PD. So three adjectives that describe your worst experience in a PD session. So we have sit and get. A lot of times when I do that, I, I spell get, G-I-T. Boring, unprepared, irrelevant, unapplicable, disengaging, sit and get lecture, snooze fest, not interactive, irrelevant, insulting, old idea. Now they're all starting to fly in. 
And, and usually when I talk about this, it's, I, I give time for everybody to kind of sit and share their, their war stories. And it's, what, what usually happens is at first people are really nervous because they're, they don't know if it's okay to, to talk about this. And then they just come flying. Uh, but I don't want to focus on the negative because we've all been part of those, those unrelated, painful, one-sided uh, experiences. And we know those just don't work when it comes to making an impact on teaching and learning. So here's what I want to do now. We're, we're going to flip this. Um, let's start thinking about those best experiences. When you've walked out of a, out of a, a, a training and said, you know what, I can do this, or you, you're inspired, what I would love to have, give me three, um, three adjectives that describe that experience for you. Collaborative, generalized, personalized, focused, energized, excited, meaningful, uh, make and take, relationship built, energizing, practical, thought provoking, differentiated, discussion based, and now they're, they're just intriguing. Connections make you think they're just going too fast now. I, I, I can't do, I, I can't follow all of those. What I want to do today is give you some examples of, of ways that, that I've tried to make those trainings more meaningful, more, more relevant, and, and, and just more engaging for my, for my teachers. Um, and what I'm also hoping is that we'll, we'll kind of go to this whole idea of together we're, we're brilliant and share some of those examples as well, those things that have worked for, work for you. Um, so so here's, here's what I've, the big question that I always have when it comes to training my teachers is, what's the best use of my face-to-face my -face time that I have with them? Because I, I'm actually very jealous of uh, a lot of you who work in buildings and districts because you get to make a, a meaningful or create a meaningful relationship with your with your teachers, um, you get to you get to work with them on a consistent basis. And a lot of times, I I meet with a teacher or a group of teachers once a year or maybe twice a, twice a, a semester or, or things like that. Um, but I I really want to frame this whole conversation around the idea of what's the best use of the face-to-face -face time that we have with teachers. So, so what I found out very, very early in, um, in my job as an ed tech consultant for the Jackson County ISD is that the bane of any tech PD is logging in. So I, I want you to think about the last time you were in a tech PD. You're probably in a computer lab, or you, everybody has a laptop. There's a bunch of you. And what happens whenever you have to log in for the first time? You're always, there's always one person who gets stuck. And when that person gets stuck, what happens to the flow of everything else that's going on? As a, as a trainer, as somebody who works with, works with teachers, that is one of the most frustrating things you can do. And when you're bald, when you don't have any hair, and you start sweating because you all of a sudden realize what happens, that's really embarrassing. But what, what I found is that, that it, it just throws off the, the entire experience for everybody. The person who's stuck is frustrated and feels all of those eyes around them beating down on them. The people who already are in are just kind of sitting around looking at their watches saying, can we get on with this? I've got important things to do. And that's just a no-win situation. This is what happened um, a, a little while ago. I was in one of those beginning of the year trainings when you know that everybody is thinking about getting their room set. And they're thinking about everything except being there. And I was trying to train 80 teachers on how to use Chromebooks for the first time. And I made the mistake. I knew I shouldn't have done it, but I went and I, I tried to get them all to log in at the same time, and it just crashed. And it was it was a horrible experience for everybody involved for those exact same reasons that that I mentioned. And I I just it, it doesn't work that way. So one of the like the little tips that I found 
and that I need to remember to, to keep following myself is when it comes to things like logging in or other stuff like that, the most important use of face to face time isn't logging in. It's actually using it and, and getting familiar with it. So one of the things that, that I try to do whenever I know that there's going to be logging in for something new is just like that video that I sent out with the in the Google form that had the questions underneath, I try to put together a quick screencast, a quick video where they are able to where I show how to log in and then I have everybody go and put in their name and I ask them were you able to log in on your own and then I kind of follow all of those those responses and then I can reach out to those people who are who are stuck and that especially helps if the if the administrator is saying you know what we need to have some things done beforehand so anything that you can do to kind of to to prevent those those bottlenecks that you know are going to happen because that's where you're the most important you're able to to kind of see those in advance and find ways to to, to avoid them so one of the, the the very first year I was I was here it was a week before school started and a local principal called up and asked can can you come in and show my teachers how to use Microsoft Office and and it was very sincere it was it was a need that they had but I just I put myself in those teachers shoes and I thought the week before school the last thing I want to do is is teach or be, have to learn about Microsoft Office because the problem is that we there were teachers at so many different levels there were teachers that knew all the ins and outs of of the of Word and PowerPoint and Excel. There were teachers who were still trying to figure out how to get to Microsoft Office, and it was it was really really tough. So what I had to figure out is how do I turn this around so that the focus isn't on Microsoft Office. And I think th this is kind of me getting up on my my soapbox a little bit. But the problem that we have a lot of times is that when some when somebody comes to us asking for help with training, they want they kind of see technology as a silo or as an extra that you get to after all of the real teaching stuff is is taken care of. Our challenge is trying to figure out how on earth to get the focus to be on the teaching and learning and seeing the the technology as a tool in order to make that make that happen that's that's something that that's really hard because so many people have had uh, or they just they see our jobs as kind of step-by-step -step people when really we're trying to make an impact on the, the teaching and learning that's happening in the in the classroom so what and the other thing that I found is that when we put teachers in a PD situation we become our students. All the things that we gripe about with students doing come out in full force whenever we're, we're doing a training. So I, that's, that's always interested me and it's always something that I try to think of when I'm in a training of, of how I can be the kind of student that I wanted to teach. Uh, but that is why a lot of the lessons that I learned from flipping my chemistry classes when I was a teacher, I tried to apply towards professional development. The idea of giving students choice, the idea of giving students the freedom to learn at their at their own pace. Um, that takes a lot of front loading on the teacher's part or on the trainer's part, but what it does is it creates an environment where students and teachers who are in the trainings have the ownership to be able to go at their own pace and it frees us up as trainers to be able to help where we're where we're needed needed the most. So as I was making the transition from the classroom to the, or the from the classroom to uh, to the ISD, I, I was doing my my master's degree um, over at Michigan State and fortunately I was able to, to focus a lot on the idea of effective professional development. And one of the things that I came around or, or that I found was this idea by Malcolm Knowles of adult learning theory and it's and it really kind of opened my eyes to what 
my teachers were going to need. And so the whole idea behind adult learning theory is that is that there's certain things that that adults, especially adult learners, need in order to be successful. So I don't want to be that guy that reads off of these or reads off of the slide, but let me just explain these six things. But so think about the last time you were working with teachers, or even think about think back to those ex good and bad experiences that you've had as a participant in a in a yes, it's and and drug I I I'm never able to to pronounce that right, and it's very close to other things that mean completely different thing. Anyway, so one of the things that adults need is they need to know why. Think about how many times you have been in a training or a professional development and in the back you're like, why do I need to know this? I have so many other things going on, I just, I, I, I need to know why. But also think that when you do understand the why, how that is able to help you be persistent how it gives you that, that, that stick with itness of being able to work through all of those issues. Another thing that we have to understand is that adults have a lot of experience, both good and bad, and that is a huge influence on, on learning. Think back to how many times you've been doing a training and you've had that one person that kind of sits at the back, folds his or her arms, and dares you to teach them something. And a lot of times the reason that is is because they are going and they're saying, you know what, I tried that already and it didn't work. Or I looked at this once and this happened. So we have to go off of that, be able to help them with that experience, uh, to, to have those positive experiences that will help them, them move forward. Also, that, that whole idea of choice. I think, especially, I know students, but especially adults, we hate to be told what to do uh, and that's just because we're, we're like that. But what if we could change around our the way we train so that that attendees and participants have choices, and and we can model that so that they have choices that get them towards the goal that we have, um, but that they don't feel like they're being told that you have to do exact or this is what you have to do and you have no input in it at all. The other one is that whole idea of relevance. If it doesn't relate to my classroom, if it doesn't relate to what I'm doing, I have so many other things going on that I am going to put that way down the list of things that I need to, to worry about. The other thing that when it comes to adult learning is that whole idea that if we can set it up in a problem-centered mode, that is going to be much better received than if it's just content. And I'll, I'll, a little bit later, I'll get more in depth. But one of the things that I always try to do is that whenever I set up a a training, I always try to frame it in terms of a problem that people experience in the classroom. Stacy Shu, who I who I work with, gave a great video that whenever we do Google Drive, it's off of um, or whenever we talk about Google Drive, it's a it's a clip from Big Bang Theory. And they're all sitting on a, on a train. They're getting ready to go to this huge conference. And what, they're, what they just realize is that they have forgotten their USB drive. And now he can't go and give this amazing paper to this professor. And, and the whole, the, the, the whole I'm, I'm just butchering this. But the, he starts singing, you forgot your flash drive. You forgot your flash drive. You forgot your flash drive. There, you, there we go, Ron. Uh, and, and how many times have teachers forgotten their flash drive and not had access to something? So if we can frame it as, as a problem, it's gonna, there's going to be a lot more buy-in. And last of all is that whole idea of how do we make it so that, this is, so that they're intrinsically motivated. Teachers want to make an impact on their classroom. They want to make a difference. All right, well, why don't we wait for Dan to uh, <laughs> get himself unfrozen? Uh, it's probably from doing that selfie video that he made uh, prior to the rally. Um, I do want to remind people that there is that collaborative Google Doc that we can be taking notes in. 
So if you don't have it open already, uh, feel free to open that and put in your notes. Uh, we will also be sharing the uh, chat. We're going to copy and paste that into the bottom of that Google Drive document. Um, so you'll have access to, the, to that as well. Um, also, after this keynote, we are going to um, share the video out to all registered attendees. Um, and so look for that uh, in your email. And um, we'll probably also share that using uh, that Michigan Instructional Tech group. So it looks like Dan is back, so I'm going to give the microphone back to him. Hey guys, I apologize that I'm not or, or for that. I'm not sure exactly what what happened. Thanks for for saving me there, Andrew. Um, but one of the things that when I started talking to my teachers, there was just a very negative perception about uh, about PD and how that how that works. Um, and I really felt that if we changed how we looked at that professional development, that we could we could make a big difference. The, the one that killed me the most was this whole idea of it, was it an effective use of of my time? And less than half of the teachers felt that PDs were a good use of their time. And almost only a third felt that they were able to take what they had learned and never or and be able to use that that right away. So I wanted to find a way to to change that. So when I started doing this flipped this whole idea of flipped PD, um, it was it was to combat all of those those negative issues that we were having, and it was very interesting because another thing that I did as I I talked to teachers is I gave them a chance to kind of ex do a free response and explain what was what was going on, um, and and Anthony, yeah, I can definitely share that that survey with you. I've I've got that. Um, just what I it, it was very basic. Um, but it was also very, very helpful. But what I noticed in the free responses that you guys gave when you when you answered those questions about your best experience and your worst experience is that these same four things came up. The, the big problem was that the reason teachers were disengaged with a lot of professional development is because they didn't see how it applied to their classroom. They also were very frustrated with the whole sit and get scenario of we watched somebody talk at us about this, but we never actually got to got to use it. The other one that came up was the whole idea of, you know what, yeah, that's great, but I really don't see how this applies to, to me and, and my classroom. And then the last one that came up a lot was the whole idea of just different, um, different background experiences. You had the people who knew it already and were bored because it was going so slow, and all the way down to the people who said that they were totally lost and that there was and that no one was there to help and just like Melissa said there there was no di differentiation the whole idea of being a sage on the stage especially when it comes to teaching or uh, tech training is just that it it works even less than when we do it in the try to try to make that happen in the classroom but after I flipped it was really interesting because I got some some feedback on their experiences and the things that that made me happy was that I saw gains in all of those areas of appropriate training time and, and learning and, and the opportunity to have hands on but the what blew me away the most was that when it came back to that whole idea of was this an effective use of my time and that when, when we were able to flip that and kind of change how we looked at at, at training more than doubled and almost the same thing with teachers who felt that they were able to use what they had learned right away um, so once again kind of think about how you could use this or just frame whatever it is you're doing in in your training so a lot of that came from the whole idea of what's called TPAC and those of you who are MAET grads you you've been TPAC'd to death but for me, this really, this is what kind of brought everything together. The whole idea that if we, if we look at teaching and technology as different silos, we're never going to be able to make that big impact on the classroom. And for those of you who haven't heard about TPAC before, uh, go to tpac.org, but 
what you have here are these, the, these circles of influence. Um, pedagogical knowledge, so knowing how to teach. Content knowledge, knowing what to teach. And then technical knowledge is how to use technology or how to use technology. Once again, if we look at all of these things as separate pieces, it, it's going to be very difficult to use technology in a transformative in a transformative way. What we need to do is frame those conversations so that they're all going together, so that you have pedago te technological, pedagogical, and content knowledge that are all working to get are all working uh, together. So. No, Andy, TPAC is not a right-wing lobbying group. But, but as, I, as I looked at, at TPAC, and especially Kim Powell, who I was lucky enough to get to work with for a while, she really helped me kind of get my head around this, is what we can do is we can use this to always start the conversation off by talking about this is how we work in the classroom, or the, the, this is what we're trying to teach. Um, so, so what I always try to do in, in flipping professional development is I always began every training that I did, no matter how long it was going to take, with a focus on classroom application. Usually that, that problem of what's, what's going on or, or something that we've all experienced in the classroom but are struggling with. And I always try to give examples. If, if we're talking about Weebly site, I want to give them lots of examples of how teachers are using websites. Uh, if we're talking about Google Drive, I want to give examples of how it's being used in the classroom. Then, whenever possible, I want to give them choices. Let them have some ownership of, of things. Uh, being able, and when I talk about choices, maybe it's choices in the tools that they use. Maybe it's choices in the projects that they're working on. But I want them to have ownership of that, so I try to differentiate those opportunities as, as much as possible. And then, in order to do that, because there's only one of me and lots of them, I want to try to do those back-end things, the, the how-to, which button to push, or the, those bottlenecks that we talked about before. I want to try to make those uh, as video tutorials so that teachers can go back and learn from those at their, at their pace. Um, and then that whole idea of, of learn by doing. Now, just a, a little funny story. Um, Brad Wilson and I were once having a t conversation on Twitter about learn by doing. And, uh, and I was using the hashtag LBD only to find out that the hashtag that most people use when they're, or what they think LBD means is little black dress. So I had some people that were, were very confused about why Brad and I were talking about little black dresses and, and other things. That, so, but the, the whole idea is that we learn by hands-on and we learn and that it's okay to learn together when we're, when we're in training. So, so let me give you some, some examples. So let's say I have that, that person that comes up and says, can you show my teachers how to use PowerPoint? Okay, well, I want to reframe that. And the way I, I could do that, one of the ways, is instead of focusing on learning the ins and outs of PowerPoint, I want to start talking about how do we create engaging presentations. And I want to focus on how do we start doing those effectively because we've all had experiences when pre presentations have worked and when they haven't. So I want to frame that whole conversation around how do we make sure that this is working effectively with, with, teach, or with students. And then I'm going to give them a choice of tools. Maybe somebody wants to use a PowerPoint. Maybe somebody wants to do a Google presentation or Haiku Deck or Prezi or any of those number, uh, any of, those number of, of tools that are out there. And then I'm either going to find screencasts or libraries that show how to go and do those things. And there's and they're out there. We don't have to spend time creating those because so many people have already done that. But then I want to set up these learn by doing projects that will help those teachers walk through how to create an engaging presentation at their own pace. And usually what I do is I set those projects up at kind of like a, a beginner 
media or intermediate and advanced. So thanks, Kim, for putting that link up. This, uh, if you're in the chat area, uh, the Learn by Doing Projects.weebly.com is something that that Kim Powell put together when we were trying to help teachers create their own Weebly sites. And what it does is it just kind of chunks things so that a teacher could jump in at any point where they feel comfortable and and move on. Uh, rather than forcing everybody to start at the beginning and work uh, together towards the towards the end. So so let's do some different scenarios and, and hopefully we'll have some time to let you share some of some of your ideas. So let's say we have one of those scenarios of you have an hour or less for PD. So here's some things that that we've done. So uh, Lee Graves Wolf's over at MSU. She inspired me by something that was called a quick fire. And the, the whole idea behind a quick fire is that you don't get any instruction on, on how to use a particular tool. What you are asked to do is you, you have this objective, something that you need to accomplish, and you know the tool that you are supposed to use, and you learn how to use the tool by meeting that objective. And this really gets teachers out of their comfort zone because they are kind of used to the whole spoon feeding of, okay, step one, tell me what to do step one, tell me what to do step two. And when we just say, hey, you know what? Try this, they get very nervous. But what we've noticed is that when we, when we do that and when we don't bail them out, when we just say, we know you can do it, just try, we wanna learn this together, they do it. They figure it out, or they at least have that experience, and, and and it allows for them to be able to to be able to experience. Now, Craig just asked, is modeling out the completely out the window? And I would say no, because what I want to do is I want to go back to that experience, and I want them to have an experience first, uh, and then I can then I can go in and model and show how to show how to do that. Uh, let, so let me let me give you an example of something that, that Brad, Stacy, Kim and I have used a lot. The, the whole idea of iPad bingo because a, a while ago we were just inundated with all of these iPad trainings and we were running into the, the same problem that everybody else runs into uh, is how do you, you're going to have teachers at all different levels, how do you get them to do it? So we tried to gamify it a little bit. What we did is we took those basic uh, things that we felt everybody should know how to do in uh, on an iPad, and we created a bingo board out of it. And what we did is before we taught them anything else, we would go and we, we would go, we'd hand out the bingo cards, and they'd all have their iPads, and we'd say, work together to check off all of these things that you can do. And we, we tried to give points and other things like that. And it was, it was a lot of fun, but it was just, it was very interesting to see how, once again, teachers were getting out of their comfort zone. They were wanting to be shown how to do everything. And we were saying, you know what, try it out. We know you can figure it out. And we would just circulate around the room and help out as needed. But the amazing thing that happened there is that it allowed teachers to start working together and they start using each other as resources. And that's where a lot of the, the power came in is all of a sudden teachers were using each other as, as resources. So that was one fun thing that we used to do with, with uh, introducing iPads. Another thing is uh, that, that we had fun with, um, and this is also iPad related, um, but in order to get them thinking about apps, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. Um, this the, we started doing this this activity of, of five picture stories, <coughs> and and what we would do is to get them to learn how to navigate the camera and other things like that, and talking about digital storytelling, is we would introduce a uh, pic collage or frame artist, or there, there's any number of, of things. Um, but what we would say is, okay, we want you to go out, 
he wants you to find five pictures of blank. And and what we loved about that was it got them using the <coughs> it got them use sorry it got them using the the iPads and using the app, but they were up, they were moving around, they were they were act active. Um, yes, thank thank you for all of you who want to give me a virtual Heimlich there. I, I I'll try not to die in front of you. Uh, now, so one of the questions is, would that be something you asked them to do before your training session or during? I always liked doing that at the very beginning because it created a, it, it gave them permission to move around, it gave them permission to learn by doing, it gave them permission to, to work with each other. Uh, but it could also be done during, and I, I think that we, we want to make sure that it's hands-on. So I, my personal preference is to use it at the very beginning to introduce things, but it could be used anytime. <coughs> so here's, uh, we're not going to have enough time. Dang it. Uh, but what I was hoping to do is that give you a scenario where you could kind of say, let's say you have somebody who approaches you, and this, is, this has happened to me several times. You know what? We have a staff meeting on school or before school on Friday. Can you come in and show us how to do X, Y, or Z? My favorite one was, can you show us how to use an iPad in like 25 minutes? Um, so, yeah, that. But there's ways that we can reframe how we look at that. Here's one of the things that we did if we have like a half day training or a or a one day training. Um, and this goes back to that whole idea of creating those learn by doing projects. We've uh, we at in Jackson we've worked together um, to to kind of create this this library and it's it's an ongoing thing but we've created these learn by doing projects for uh, Google Apps or Google Docs or Google Drive we've got, uh, Kim put together an amazing one for for Weebly and so we're trying to put together all these resources these learn by doing uh, examples where if we had a day it would be hands-on and teachers could go at their own pace rather than waiting for us to show them how to do it and then giving and, and then saying okay now you try <coughs> um, so so here's an example if you go to bit.ly slash flipped PD example this is one that I put together for uh, teaching how to use or how to do screen or formative assessments with with screencasts and part of the, the learn by doing project is that I wanted them to either create a, a TED Ed video or embed a YouTube video in a Google form and how to use those in order to, to collect formative assessment uh, information. But one that, uh, th that we've really enjoyed, and this could be adapted for anything, it happens to be iPad, but it could, like I said, it could be adapted for, for anything, is uh, Brad Wilson got this idea from Wes Fryer, who is out in Oklahoma, and he created what was called the iPad Media Camp. And the whole idea is that you would learn how to use the iPad by creating, by, by doing all of these, these different things. And if you, if you follow those links, um, it, it's just what Wes has put together is absolutely amazing of just being able to learn technology through the lens of of teaching and learning. Let me move a, move ahead here just because of because of time. But the long term PD is where it gets where it gets really exciting. And this is what I, I, I've been trying to make happen here in, in Jackson and with the, the districts that I work with. Um, and this is where a lot of you who are working in individual districts have that advantage because you get to you have those relationships with those teachers and you can see them every day or you can see them more often and really build this long-term PD. Um, one, of, one of my heroes, and her ears are probably burning right now, is Kristen Daniels, who's out in Minnesota. She has really um, just pioneered this whole idea of ongoing flipped PD and how that works. So I'm gonna show a video really fast and hopefully it doesn't freeze up on, on anybody, but, uh, this really describes how she does 
that whole idea of Flip PD and what we're trying to do here in, in Jackson. With flipped professional development, Wayne and I really wanted to spend our time with teachers in a very meaningful way. And we've both done traditional PD where we speak to a group of teachers and uh, it's becoming more, more and more frustrating because I look at the teachers out there and I know some of them are not getting it and I know some of them are bored and I know some of them have completely checked out. So what we've been doing is we have um, pretty much monthly meetings where technology integration specialists will come to our building. We get at least two hours to sit with them and, you know, I can say, I want to do this or I want to learn how to do that. We meet with them in small groups and we actually listen first and we kind of find their strengths and their weaknesses, their interests. It had a, an opportunity for teachers to take risks, to take, uh, to be adventurous and to try things because they knew they had us as support and backup when they embarked on a new innovative project. We weren't seeing much gain from folks going to conferences and coming back because if they wanted to do something bold or new or something they thought really in the best interest of their kids, they didn't have anybody to rely on it on a day-to-day -day basis. So to me, it was just clear, we need to have some technology integration folks, and not just one or two. We need to have enough to really support our elementary, our junior high, middle school age, and then our high school kids as well. We came up with the idea of flipping professional development in the same way that we flip classroom processes. And we discovered that it became very popular with our teachers and, and administrators in a short amount of time. Certainly, we all, we all need to be up to speed with, you know, what... So, so that video was made by our, our friends at TechSmith in, in Okemos, but it kind of tells the story of, of what um, what Kristen and Wayne are doing over we're in uh, o over in Minnesota, and, and that's something that, that we've tried to do. The their website is flippd.org, and I would definitely try to or check that out because what they have done in a nutshell, and what we're we're trying to do here as as well, is find ways to give that personalized professional development to teachers rather than just the the one size fit all. We want to, to make sure that teachers know that we are there to help them out with what is most important to, to them. And the way that, that Kristen has it set up is because she's in, our, Kristen and Wayne, they were in uh, buildings and they would work all the time with the, the same teachers, is they would set it up where every month each, um, each group of teachers would have two hours to work with them, to work directly with them. And they would have subs come in um, and kind of have a rotating sub, or rotating subs. So three teachers would work with them for two hours and then go back to their classrooms. Three new teachers would come in and work with them for two hours and just throughout the day. And what, what Kristen and Wayne did there was they set it up where all of the teachers had, had technology goals. And I can share the, the resources that they put together on how to track that and, uh, and, and what it allowed them to do is have more one-on-one -on -one time with teachers but also focus that on the teaching and learning goals that those teachers had for their classroom. So let's say one teacher wanted to focus on uh, having students do a better job of, of describing uh, or being, yeah, doing a better job of describing things. Well, they would go and they would sit down, they'd talk, and they'd come up with a goal together. And maybe that goal was about how to create uh, ebooks, or maybe it was about how they went and uh, or, or how to do better digital storytelling or blogging or, or other things like that. Well, because they knew that they were going to get to meet with Kristen and Wayne once a month, 
it allowed for that P to be ongoing. And what they found was that those teachers, they weren't just doing, they weren't just waiting for those two hours. They were working on things on their own time. They were trying stuff out in the classroom. And every time they met, they were talking about the application. And, and then being able to take, after talking about the application, then being able to go in and uh, talk or and figure out those details of what they needed to know technologically in order to make that to make that happen. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of people that would like to see that uh, template, and I can definitely find it. It's it's on uh, Google Drive, and Kristen shares it with everybody. So I will I will forward that link on to to all of you. So. Um, What I would like to do is just finish with that whole idea of, of why we're here today. You guys are doing amazing things in your classroom, or amazing things with your teachers. And what I hope is that we all understand that because we're all doing amazing things, that when we work together, we can help each other out in ways that we can never do on our on our own because that whole idea of alone we're smart and together we're brilliant I believe in a hundred percent so thank you for letting me share a little bit of, of my experience if there's anything that I can do to help fill in details or other things please let me know and have a great day awesome thank you so much Dan for presenting for a keynote um, if you could please pod Dan, feel free to use the uh, applause within Adobe Connect. So I'll keep doing that, um, and I'll do it too. And uh, you can clap in the chat, which a lot of people are doing as well. So awesome job, Dan. Glad you survived. And <laughs> we were a little worried there for a minute. So uh, we've only got about two minutes.